All right, so it is my great honor to welcome James Zimmerman. Uh, James Zimmerman has spent many years in this part of the world, in Beijing specifically, 26 years. Uh, he is a lawyer by profession, but he is here to present his most recent book, which uh, I spent the weekend reading and must admit it is really quite a rollicking read. Uh, it has been uh, acclaimed by many different uh, reviewers, uh, the New York Times, where it's made the editor's choice list, so they're very prestigious. Uh, it also has very positive reviews from the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, the Associated Press, uh, the South China Morning Post, amongst many others. And perhaps as a measure of how successful this book has been, uh, I believe there are talks about making a film adaptation, so very successful. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to James to talk a bit about uh, the book, and then um, I'll moderate a bit of a discussion and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Oh, thank you, Nathan. Um, and um, it's a great pleasure to be here, a great honor to be here. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk about this, the Peking Express story. Um, before I begin, as it was mentioned, it's uh, China's great train robbery of 1923. Um, you may have the thought thinking, well, does this have a Macau connection? And as far as I know, no. But it does have a Portugal connection. And I'll go into details on that as how the Portuguese government was involved in the matter. Uh, and it's something that was really impacted both China as well as a number of foreigners that were um, living and in, in working in China at the time. But just kind of just uh, in a nutshell about the, about the story, um, 1923 was a horrible time for China. Uh, it was what we called the warlord era. You know, when the Qing um, dynasty fell in 1911, 1912, um, there was warlord after warlord that came into power. It was like a revolving door of leaders. And the China was not unified. I mean, there was warlords in, throughout the country and not just at, you know, um, at regional levels, but, you know, in, in, at the munici in municipal levels and so forth. So you had warlords everywhere. You know, and it was um, a constant um, process of a lot of wars going on, where one warlord would be fighting another warlord to take over, you know, whatever for territorial gains or whatever to control the, whatever part of the countryside they were in. In the process of um, of all these battles and wars, um, you would find situations where there was a lot of soldiers who were basically disbanded. All right, and they were, but they were using men that were armed, you know, and but had no jobs and really no place to go, and, you know. And rather than dealing with the situation, the the warlords that prevailed, you know, rather than disarming them and giving them, you know, jobs and food and so forth, basically they engaged in bandit suppression campaigns. So they thought that it's better just to wipe them out than to try to resolve the issues. So you had, um, in, the, in, in that time, in the uh, early 20s, there was um, millions of men roaming the countryside looking for, looking for work, looking for food. You know, in southern Shandong, there was a gentleman by the name of Sun Meiyao, who was, um, he was an officer in a local militia, um, and he was one of those disbanded soldiers, and he had 700 men and they were just looking to go home, you know, and um, rather than supporting his efforts just to go home and be disarmed, the provincial um, warlord in Shandong province, you know, who did not like Sun Miao, wanted to crush him and basically wipe out his men. And to send a message to Sun Miao, the warlord in power basically executed his brother, you know, took, um, decapitated his head, and he hung the head, um, his head, the brother's head, at a railway station in southern Shandong as a message to Sun Miao that he was not welcome to go home. So Sun Miao decided that he had had enough, and he was going to make a political statement, and that was that the warlords and the central government needed to, to, to do more to support those disbanded soldiers, to do away with the warlord systems. He had a whole social agenda, you know, and so he was, um, you know, made a decision that he was going to derail the Peking Express. Now, the Peking Express is a, um, 
was the train between Shanghai, you know, in, in Peking, in Beijing. Um, China had a, took a long, long time to warm up to the ideas of, of the railroads. Um, you know, backing up a bit, in 1876 was the, the first railroad that China had, and it was a, it was a 10 mile um, tr um, track from the city of Shanghai to the port of Wusong. Now that, it took years to build this rail line, and then they only, it only operated for one year. And the Chinese government, the Qing government at the time, made a decision that they were gonna tear up the track and basically throw it in the ocean. So China's initial you know, experience with railroads was not great. Now fast forward to 1900, around the time of the Boxer Rebellion, China only had about, about 10, 20 miles of usable track. Now in comparison, the United States had 192,000 miles of track across the country, servicing every you know, pioneer town you know, in the country. Europe was the same. There was railroads were being built everywhere. So in 1900, China was really way, way behind the times, actually in, a, in another world. So the Qing government, you know, after the Boxer Rebellion, decided you know, they started to warm up to the ideas of building a railroads. Take, um, and they had no money, they had no technology, so they welcomed a number of um, you know, uh, foreign countries as well as foreign companies and foreign banks to come in and help build the railroad. Now by 1920, there was about 5,000 miles of track that had been built. And they realized, and after the Qing government fell, they realized that this was a way to, the railroads was a way to unify the country. And it was not just you know, to drive commerce or to trade or tourism, but it was to unify the country. So in 1923, um, in January of 1923, they launched the express trains. And what that was, the express trains were, you know, top-notch, top-notch technology of the day. They, uh, Chinese government had invested a sub substantial amount of money bringing in locomotives from um, all over the world and passenger carriages, you know, that were considered to be technological marvels. And why? Because they, the, car, the, the carriages were all steel, all right? Before that, before there was all steel carriages, most carriages were made of wood. And the problem with wood is, is if there's a collision, they have uh, what's called telescoping. One car goes on top of another, and the fatality rate is very high. And um, you know, there's uh, the concerns about fires as well. So to have all steel construction was a big deal. So the Chinese government had spent a lot of money. And they had started to promote tourism in a way that was, they'd never seen before. So the, the express trains were going to drive the commerce and trade, but pe moving people from Shanghai to Peking and other points across the country. Now, before the trains to go from Shanghai to Peking was a five-day journey. All right, now that, you know, you know, that is depending on the weather, too. All right, so um, today, of course, if you go between Beijing and Shanghai by high-speed train, it's about four and a half to five hours. All right, so when they built the express trains, you know, 1923, it took a predictable 36 hours. So that was a big deal. And so they really promoted the, the train service. Um, so tourists from all over the world were making decisions that they were going to see China. You know, the way they got there was they would take, you know, Trans-Pacific um, ships across the ocean and then they would take the train across the country. Now, um, the only concern is, is that the express trains went through what is considered to be banded country. You know, so right through where Sun Miao and a lot of other of these bandit leaders were. So you have to imagine yourself, um, you have to imagine yourself at the Shanghai Nanking Railway Station on May 5th, 1923, and you see oh, there's 300 people getting ready to board this train for a trip from Shanghai to Peking. 
and you're sitting there, you got your kids, you know, you got your spouse, and you heard somebody say, hey, we're going through bandy country, you know, and you're like, wait a minute. I mean, I didn't sign up for a trip of, that was gonna be risky here. So you pull out the 1921 edition of the Handbook for China by Carl Crow. Now this, at the time, was the Lonely Planet Guidebook for China, all right? I mean, very detailed, lots of maps, and Carl Crow has a whole section on bandits. All right, now what is, you're at the train station, somebody says, we're going through a bandit country, and then you pull out your guidebook and then you read it, and it says, all in all, travel on the regular routes is as safe in China as in any other part of the world. Robbers and pirates exist, of course, and there is usually a revolution or rebellion going on in some part of the country. But, but these things add zest rather than danger to the journey. All right, so you're sitting there, so don't worry. No, it's okay. We're gonna go through bandit country, but Carl Crow says it's okay. So anyway, in that, in that waiting room, you have all sorts of very, very interesting people, and you, you hear, you hear English, you hear Spanish, you hear um, German, Italian, you hear Japanese, you hear multiple Chinese dialects, so languages from all over. And so you're thinking, wow, this is a real diverse group of people that are boarding the train. You see lawyers, Italian lawyers, you see business people, you see the movers and shakers of the Jewish community that was building Shanghai's financial and real estate markets. You have tourists, tourists from around the world. In fact, there was two families that, um, that there are two, two US Army majors who were actually stationed in Manila um, at the time. And they decided, like all expats, if you're an expat, you go, yeah, let's go see China. You know, let's take the train and take the family and we'll all go up there. So they're sitting in Manila and they decide they're gonna do their vacation in China. So you have all these people. Um, the movers and shakers, very important. And on the Chinese side, you have the grandson of Wan Shikai, who's um, getting on the train as well. But one of the most conspicuous um, individuals in that crowd of 300 people is a lady, and there's a photo of her with this wide, you know, Easter bonnet hat. And her name is Lucy Aldrich, and she happens to be the sister-in-law of John D. Rockefeller Jr. All right, you know, big oil man, you know, very, very, very important guy. Um, you also had, and the gentleman on the far right is a well-known publisher from Mexico, all right? He and his wife were on an around the world honeymoon, you know, lucky them, but they were on the around the world honeymoon um, and they decided that they were also gonna ride the Peking Express. So anyway, they board the train in the morning of May 5th. They take comfort in the fact that they've got Carl Crow saying there's nothing to worry about. Plus there's guards on the train and there's also, the trains are guarded by the railway police, supposedly, and we'll get to that in just a second. So, the bandits, all right, interesting group on their own. They, as I mentioned, most of them, including the leader was, uh, Su Miao was um, a disbanded soldier, um, but there was also people from, with a very a broad range of backgrounds, and um, after World War I, or actually during World War I, China was not involved with the war, but they supplied workers. In Shandong province where this happened, they had provided over 200,000 men to go to Europe to support the, the efforts of the French in the, in the British armies. And now what they did, the 200,000 men, when they got to Europe, they learned about modern weapons, but for the most part, they were digging trenches and digging graves. All right, now, when World War I ended in 1918, most of them were sent back to China. Unfortunately, they didn't have jobs. You know, so you had a, a number of people, a number of the men in the bandit group were from the China Labor Corps. Now, they were very different in the sense that they also spoke multiple languages. 
They spoke French, they spoke German, they spoke some English, and so you had these very sophisticated Chinese bandits. Uh, and there was also one that spoke Russian, who was a guy that, you know, he actually served in the Russian army during the, um, the Russian Revolution. So the bandits themselves were a very, very interesting group. So Sun Miao's group were about 700 men, were very disciplined, most of them soldiers or part of the China Labor Corps. The others, there was about 300 that were under the leadership of a guy by the name of Popo Po Lu, and they were the real bandits. They were the guys that were real thieves, they were opium addicts, they were alcoholics, they were the real bad guys in the whole story too. But anyway, that was the bandit, that was the bandits. All right, so now, the train goes from Shanghai to Peking, and Sun Miao decides to derail the train. Now, this was in, in the middle of the country in southern Shandong, and the train was derailed at 2.30 in the morning, and what he did was he removed what is called the fish plates, all right? Um, today, train track is all welded together, so it's very smooth, but back then, and even if you, if you ride in trains in places all over the world, but if, if you ride on slower trains, um, and uh, you may recall that if you, when, as the trains slow down, you hear this click, 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 click. Well, that's where, the, that's where the fish plates hold the rails together, because the rails themselves are only 50, 60 you know, feet long, and they're held together. So what Sun Miao did was he removed the fish plates on 16 rails, all right, and um, he chose a spot that was on an incline in a curve, and so the locomotive had to slow down to about 10 miles an hour. Now, these things are not like the high-speed trains today going to whatever, 300 miles an hour. The trains back then were, if they could reach a speed of 40 miles an hour, was, was really good, you know, it was pretty fast. So, but anyway, Sun Miao chose a spot that was where the train was forced to slow down. On top of that, I mean, Sun Miao was a very smart man. He, um, through his spies, his network of spies, he um, found out that the railway guards, and the railway guards were those that were every like 100 yards on the track, you know, sentries that actually protected the track. They were not working that night. And why? because the, the chief of the railway police was having his birthday party in Tianjin, and everybody went up there, and so basically the track that night was effectively unguarded. You know, so people ask the question, why did Su Miao choose that night? Was it because of all these prominent passengers? No, there's always prominent passengers on the train, but he chose because it was the, the, um, the, the rail track was unguarded. So this happened. Now, 1,000 bandits attack the train, and they take 75 Chinese, high wealth Chinese from the first and second class cars, and 25 foreigners hostage and start trekking across the countryside. They go a total of 34 miles, and they stop at different locations while the Chinese army is in pursuit. Um, and it lasted for six weeks. So, and there's a lot of people involved in helping with the negotiations, including the governments for the hostages from various countries. Now, the role of Portugal you know, is that the minister, the ambassador at the time, his name is Jose de Freitas, if I say that right. So he is a, a he was the senior diplomat. He started in China in 1891 and had been there longest. So even back then, most countries would send um, you know, their ministers for maybe three years, maybe two years, so there was a constant rotation. So, um, so the Portuguese minister had been there a long time. He was fluent in Chinese. He knew everyone. You know, his role was he basically represented all of the foreign diplom the, the foreign diplomatic corps. All right, his job was to go into the these with to the state council and say what's going on now. He was, got very, very frustrated during negotiations because the Chinese had, the central government had very little information and then they had no solution, 
they, did, they didn't have, had no plan on how to solve it. And so he got extremely frustrated. And one of the scenes in the story is he just walked in unannounced at a state council meeting, all right? And he basically barged in, all right? And here's a guy speaking fluent Chinese, and they're saying, take a seat. Would you like some tea? And he said, I'm not sitting down until you release, you get the foreign hostages released. So his role was really in putting a lot of pressure on the Chinese government to do something. You know, so that's Portugal's involvement in the story. Now, the actual diplomats that were on the scene during the negotiations, they were there representing the countries that had most of the hostages. And, you know, there was someone from, from Italy, from France, from um, Britain, as well as the United States. The couple from Mexico, and Mexico did not have anybody in, in the country at the time, and so their interests were represented by the U.S. So you had all of these, you know, diplomats, and you had you had Catholic priests, you know, you have Presbyterian missionaries, um, a lot of people trying to get involved and support and help. Now, what happened? I'm not going to give the whole story totally away, but um, oh, before I get to that, the correspondence. Word got around the world, world very, very fast. And part of that is because there was a lot of, of uh, journalists that were actually on the train, all right? And some of those journalists became hostages. Some of them escaped. And some actually took, were on the train the next day, so they actually were on the scene. The journalists did an amazing job. You know, I think back then there's no satellites, there's no internets. You know, the way the word gets around the world you know, is by undersea cable, by telegram, you know, and in the best example of how the world, the word got around the world is that John D. Rockefeller Jr. was working in his garden in what's called Seal Harbor, Maine, on the morning of May 6, 1923, just enjoying a beautiful spring day, and then a reporter came up to him and said, do you have a comment about the fact that your sister-in-law has been taken hostage by Chinese bandits in the middle of nowhere of China. Rockefeller said, I don't believe that. You know, part of it is because he runs what's called Standard Oil Company of New York, which has offices all over China. He said, I would have heard about it. So he basically was dismissive of the journalists, all right, but he got on the phone with the U.S. Secretary of State and said, what's going on in China? Secretary of State says, I have no idea. But then they started saying cable after cable after cable, cable and sure enough, his sister-in-law was held hostage by Chinese bandits. So the reporters did a fabulous job at getting the word out, and for a period of six weeks, this was in the front news everywhere. All right. So it ended up being a 37-day hostage crisis. Most of it was at this mountain in the corner called Pazuku Mountain. And if you've been to Shandong, this part of Shandong is where Taishan is. Taishan is a very um, mystical, considered magical, religious. Uh, it's considered like the holy land of China. You know, um, this mountain called Pazuku Mountain is actually the poor man's Taishan. All right, and the, um, it's a, it, for four centuries was a bandit stronghold. Now, at the, at the foothills of this mountain was a temple where the hostages spent most of their time, but some of the hostages were dragged up to the top of the mountain. And, now, and anyway, this ended up being a hostage crisis for you know six weeks. Now, the story doesn't end when they're released. And they were eventually released. And there's a whole lot of side stories that go into what's going on. But where the book ends is where the warlord in power, who was very unhappy as to what Sun Miao did, he, in December of 1923, which is six months after the, the release of the hostages, he, the warlord rounds up all of the bandits and executes them. So, um, but there's a lot of different side stories and issues and things that go on in that. So I, I, how it ends, well, I really didn't want to tell you, but I kind of gave you some of it. But anyway, 
it was the subject of a 1932 movie, even though the facts are very, very different. They called this the Shanghai Express because the train was going south instead of north. It's the Peking Express. Um, it was nominated for Best Picture in 1932 and won the Academy Award for Cinematography. It's a fabulous movie if you ever want to watch and get an idea of what old trains look like. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a great movie. Um, the only thing it's factually very different from the Peking Express because um, everything in the movie happens on the train. In the real story, most of what happens is being dragged across the countryside and uh, being held, uh, held hostage in the mountains. So, and as Nathan mentioned, though, I'll be making an announcement in Beijing when I get back home. Um, a group of filmmakers, um, we've reached an agreement to move forward with the development of a film um, of the Peking Express. Um, interesting thing is, is when the Shanghai Express came out, one of the book review, or one of the film reviews, basically said, yeah, it was a great movie, however, the real story's better. You know, so we'll see. The filmmakers that are involved are very, very well known. Um, the director is, uh, identified director is a very well known Chinese director, and the producers are um, global, British and American, and so this is gonna be uh, a multinational multi um, production. So, but I'll end my comments there, um, and yeah. So, Nathan, questions, thoughts, or? All right, so thank you. Um, I, I do highly recommend the book. I, I spent my weekend reading it and enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, so my first question is, how did you come across this topic? Right? I, I, I don't, I'm not a specialist of the Republican period, but I do teach a, a course on um, sort of modern China, and I have, not, I have not heard of it, actually. And it seems like it's quite a big deal, actually, as, as you discussed. So, so how did you come across this topic, and why did you choose this topic in, in particular to write? this really fabulous book. Yeah. Um, in my day job as a lawyer in Beijing, um, part of my practice involves what we call hostage diplomacy. You know, it's more what we call a white collar practice where um, mostly foreigners are detained for reasons other than violating the law. You know, they become tools of negotiations. And so it's something that you know, it's um, hostage diplomacy has always been an issue, um, a concern, and something that um, that I find very fascinating. And so I decided back in around 2014 to start researching um, to start researching more about the historical use of hostages in China. And, and China, it's not limited to China. I mean, the use of hostages is something that's used all over the world, and it continues today. But my point is I, I, I became fascinated and started looking at situations mostly in the early 20th century where mostly foreigners in China were either um, captive by governments or, or warlords or bandits and so, and there's a lot of examples. And then I came across this and I was like, wow, this is an interesting story. And, and, and the records I had been looking at were archives in Nanjing and so there was a lot of telegrams. And from there I decided I'm gonna you know, go into archives in other parts of the world and, and then um, the thing that, the thing that I knew I had a story to write when I chased the family records. And there was a lot of, a lot of families of, of descendants, you know, I mean the descendants of, of those that were involved either from hostages or bandits or rescuers. And so I found records all over the world, in France, in Italy, um, in the United States, um, you know, so, and it was amazing how much stuff people kept that had not been placed into like a university archives. And um, as an example, in the, um, there's a gentleman in the story by the name of Roy Scott Anderson who actually negotiates the deal. So in the family records of the Anderson family in a farmhouse in Western Massachusetts is the original agreement between Anderson and the bandits. I mean, Chinese language, beautiful document. So I'm, and when I found that, I first I told the family they got to put this in archive. This is a historical document. I knew it existed because I've seen copies in China. 
But this, um, and both copies were handwritten. There's actually two copies of this. But in the Anderson family records is the original. And then there was other families that, um, and it was amazing because they, the diaries, you know, there was, um, you know, hostages that were, you know, for six weeks, they, one guy kept a 175-page diary. I mean, it was an amazing resource for a, a historian because I was able to see, you know, what he ate and what he didn't eat. And what about and how he you know I mean his hygiene and he talked about the attitudes of the bandits he talked about the attitudes of other hostages and so the the documents in the family records were amazing so to, the way I came across this is through records but I knew I had a story to write when I got the family records right and um. Uh, as an historian, I went first to the footnotes or the uh, the end notes, and uh, very impressed. Uh, you're working with documents from really all over the world, from archives, but also personal collections. And uh, so the other question I have is, you tell a very compelling narrative, and it's it's very well written, very well constructed. I think all the praise that you have from various reviewers is is deserved. And so I'm curious, given the sheer amount of material you dealt with, how did you come up with the narrative that you did? How do you choose? Uh, which accounts to perhaps um, know to, uh, include, which accounts to prioritize and deprioritize. And what did you, did you come up, I mean, this is a very sensational story, right? And so did you come up with, uh, come across sort of false information and how did you sort of deal with that? It, it, it took a long time because I mean, I started this in 2015 and finally f finished the manuscripts in 2019 and then went through an editorial process. But I mean, I had thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. I mean, there was in the personal files, the family files, there was letters, you know, and there was, um, and there was um, diaries and all sorts of things and you have to, you have to make a decision what to include and what not. Now, the manuscript, the original manuscript was over 600 pages, all right? And the publisher said, eh, you know, it's got to go down to like 325, 330. I mean, that's the way, you know, they deal with these kinds of, you know, stories. It's, um, you know, they don't want this to be like war and peace. I mean, something that's like this sick. It's not going to sell or it's not going to be interesting. People get lost in it. So it has to, it has to read really fast. And so I, um, I had to, I had to um, narrow down the number of characters, you know, because even like when the, the train robbery occurred, there's a lot of people that escaped, you know, but I mean, I can't talk about 20 people and how they escaped because this, it's still the same thing. They jumped off the train, they ran through the fields. All right, so I had to narrow it down and talk about two or three that escaped. So it was a process of deciding what goes in the story and what not to keep the narrative moving quickly. And so that, you know, is a decision that, you know, the writer makes to tighten things up. Um, but pretty much, um, you know, that's a, that's a very detailed process in review. Otherwise, if this book was 600 pages, it would be, I wouldn't say it'd be more academic, but it would be more of a history lesson that was the other issue, is the publisher said, look, you know, the history lesson's wonderful, but put a lot of it in the footnotes, you know, the details on the history, so try to move the story as quick as you can, so. so you mentioned um, this cast of characters, uh, and there is a very wide cast of characters of all different nationalities, Chinese, American, Italian, French, Spanish, right, a, a Portuguese diplomat. Yeah. Um, did you have a favorite going through, or, or did you find any surprises going through? Because, um, yeah, you, there are quite a, this is a very international incident that involves diplomats, journalists, financiers, you know, the well-heeled as well. So yeah, did you have a favorite character, or one that you related to most in this process? Oh yeah, my favorite character is, is the Chinese bandit, Sun Mao. <laughs> I mean, by, by far, because, you know, he was, um, I mean, he had an agenda. And he, um, I mean, I think he was actually suffering inside, you know, and he, um, and just so you know, I actually met his grand nephew, all right? So his grand nephew is late 70s, all right? Um, was not, obviously was not around in 1923, and so my questions to his grand nephew were, you know, um, what were the stories, the family stories that you heard about Sun Miao? And he said he was a man of the people. I mean, he 
really felt strongly about protecting his men, his 700 men. He was very charismatic. He was very well liked, you know. Um, but in, it was very interesting in meeting the grand nephew and hearing the views that he heard in the family, you know, that had passed down, you know, through the generations. And so, I, to answer your question, clearly was Sun Miao. Um, and even it's funny the discussions with the um, the director and the producers that I've been talking with. They're going to be. They're like that's going to be a great character because, I mean, whoever is in that role is going to have a really good time. Now, there's other characters, too, you know, but am I rooting for anyone at any time? I mean, I, I, I would say that there's several. I mean, um, the role of the Catholic priest, you know, I mean, in, in trying to resolve and negotiate things. I mean, he was a, a phenomenal person. I mean, there's also characters that I didn't like, and part of... And part of that was because in their own writings, you know, you see a lot of racism and, and things like that. And I'm, uh, as a, as a, to try to be objective as a historian, you can't, you got to look at the times, of course, and all of that. But in, in, you can't help by human nature saying, I don't really like this guy. He's really kind of, you know, there's something not right about him. But, and that's, that includes some of the hostages were really racist, you know. But um, but overall, I mean, there was um, there's people that are likable, um, and and then even with Rockefeller's sister-in-law, in the beginning of this, her four day, she was re she wasn't released. She actually was abandoned, but her time. You know, in the beginning, when she's on the train, she's a very aristocratic, very arrogant, very almost you know, like nasty, and basically telling the bandits to go away and all that. And then, as she is basically rescued by these poor villagers that have no food, no nothing, and the kids you can see are all scarred by smallpox and everything, she goes through this almost personal transformation where she has more respect for them. Than ever. I mean, she basically was sleeping in a mud hole, you know, when they found, basically when they, she was so called rescued. So her story is almost is compelling in a way that, you know, you see this transformation in the way she t views, you know, some of the rural areas of China. So thank you. And finally, did you have any big surprises that you came across as you're working with or preparing this work? Any yeah, particular surprise. Yeah, I mean, when you're reading thousands and thousands of pages and a lot of media reports and things, there's things that, um, you know, surprise you that, and some of it is you can't prove it, and you wonder if it should be part of the story or not. And one of the things that I was unable to prove, and I really didn't even mention this in the story, but there was, um, there was comments in the, in the government records that the bandits got the idea of derailing the train from watching an American movie. I'm like, well, I mean, where's the cinema? I mean, there's cinemas in, in 1923, there's, there's movie cinemas in Shanghai, um, in Tianjin, but really, and so I, I actually, I mean, you, when you read this, um, you can't prove it. So that was a surprise, but I think the biggest surprise for me was seeing how these families had maintained records that were just incredible. This one family had a blanket from the train, you know, and it's a beautiful blanket, um, a knife from one of the bandits. I mean, just all these artifacts, coats that they got, it was a gift, you know. And because some of the hostages were actually children, you know, the bandits gifted things to the children, and so the children have kept it, you know, their entire lives. The other thing that was a surprise in communicating with the descendants, some of them came to China, you know, and one of the hostages, the granddaughter, came twice and we climbed up to the top of the mountain. Another one was, and I didn't even locate him, I was trying to find him, but the Presbyterian missionary that was, um, he was involved, but in the book itself, it's only mentioned in a footnote. And he was a Presbyterian mission in, missionary that provided food and provided some support, but he played a very, very minor role. But after the book came out, the grandson, who's in his mid-80s, contacted me, you know, and he said, hey, my grandfather was part of the story. And so he said, I'd like to come to China and retrace his steps. And so in October, uh, I took him back to the Presbyterian mission 
that's still in operation is a Christian church in China. And the whole church council was there just to meet the grandson of the guy that founded the mission back in the 20s. So, I mean, if you, in terms of a surprise for me as a writer, is all of the stuff that comes with it. Not, and it's just in the research process, meeting the families, and then after the fact, you know, people contacting me that says, hey, my grandfather or my great uncle were part of that story. So. Thank you. Well, I, I could talk with you all day, but I think it's unfair to the audience uh, to have them listen. So if anyone has any questions, uh, perhaps we can take some questions from the audience. I think someone, someone will hand you a microphone in a little bit. <laughs> Hello, James. I'm thinking that all oh, the book, the, uh, the actors in the book, they add a uh, wonderful experience, but you also had a wonderful experience writing the book. It was very nice, right? How was your experience writing the book? Did you have a good experience? Oh, definitely. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience. Yeah, it was a wonderful experience in writing the book. I mean, it was, um, it was in working with through the editorial process, it was pretty, ex I mean, it was, uh, it was pleasant. I, I mean, when I finished the first manuscript, it was too long. You know, and the publisher says you got to edit it. So um, I almost had to rewrite the whole thing, and yes. and but overall, it was just a wonder. It was a wonderful experience. I mean, I would do it again in a heartbeat. Yeah, I was asking myself, why do you have so many photos? And after you said that there are reporters, so I can understand why do you have so many photos, right? Photos, you mean? Okay, um, in the, what happened was a lot of these people were tourists, all right, and some of them had cameras, and at the time, you know, photography was really taking off in 1923. Now, there was two of the hostages. I mean, at the time of the train robbery, all the cameras were damaged and destroyed, but as the, um, as the hostage crisis went on and on, there was a, a mail system. They were able to deliver things up to the bandit camps, including letters and, and so forth. And so two of the hostages had their wives send cameras up. And with the cameras actually in the, um, I mean, uh, the cameras um, in, cameras up at the bandit camps, you, like in the top left corner, in the middle, those were all taken um, at the temples. And so those cameras were the ones that were smuggled up. And in one, in, in multiple families, there was, I mean, there was so many photos that had never actually, some of these had never been ever published. And that was, uh, but so, so you know, in the book, I have 24 photos um, and on the website, there's more because I could put more up without, you know, the, the, the publishers just only wanted to limit it to 24. But yeah, the photos come from the two of the hostages. Uh, um, and so there's the, and that's what's like, the, the, the photo in the middle at the bottom is, um, you know, that was taken by one of the hostages. And you can see the guy in the front was actually a Chinese hostage. And then to his, to his left, or to, um, is one of the bandits. So there's a number of bandits around him, you know. And so the bandits themselves were like posing. Um, in the top left, that is the final eight hostages. And, and the guy that took the photo's not in it, you know, but that's the, the final eight. And what happened in the end of the story is, is that the bandits actually wanted to keep a couple you know, for security purposes, but they all decided we're not going until we all go. So, and by that, there's, in that group is four nations represented. I have two more quick questions, okay? Two more. What part of the book is fiction? Oh, good question, <laughs> zero. Now, the thing is, I've asked that question. I mean, uh, people have asked me, have, did you take what we call literary license? And I said, no. I did, a part of it is I didn't have to because I had so much to work with, a lot. Uh, in, in addition to all of the documents, the narrative comes from the letters or comes from the diaries 
Um, it comes from the media reports. As, I mean, the correspondents were there writing every single day. So I didn't feel like I needed to make anything up. Now, I've also climbed that mountain. I mean, I've, ex I've been there. I've been there a dozen times. I've actually hiked from the bottom up three times. You know, and part there's there is you can't really see it, but there's a cable car that goes up to the, on the side, and it it kind of doesn't work all the time, you know. So, you know, I'm, I've hiked, I've climbed it three times. It's enough for me. So I'm, I'm I want to go when the cable car is working, but you never know if it's working or not. So, but anyway, um, but going to the site is important because you gotta. You've got to, when you write a, hist a non-fiction historical narrative, which is not fiction, it has to be true, but in order to do that, you really need to experience what these people went through. And I can tell you that the temples are in almost the same condition they were today as in 1923. In fact, there's a tree that is over like 1,200 years old that is still in that courtyard, in that temple. And the hostages, as well as the bandits, slept under that tree. And I've been there so many times, and I would sit there and just look at the tree and just imagine what these people went through. So to answer your question, I mean, I didn't need to make anything up. I didn't, and that's a good thing. Um, and um, because this is 100%, 100% true. Um, the last one, sorry. You still have a lot of material, right? You still have a lot of material you, you didn't use in the book. Are you going to write another one? So you have a lot of material that you did that, a lot of stuff didn't make it into oh, yeah. the book. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, is that, I mean, there was, if you compare the 600 page manuscript to the 320, I basically had to cut it in half. I mean, and again, part of that was, you know, I mean, when the train robbery took place, there was, there were people that escaped, you know, and I, the, the editor said, okay, we get it, people jumped off the train, ran in the cornfields, how many times do you need to say that? So there are some characters that are, um, what I had to do is I had to put them in the footnotes, you know, because without repeating what, what a lot of other people did, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of materials that, uh, um, that has had to be removed only, I mean, only because to not, it doesn't disrupt the story. The story is still there. I mean, from beginning to end, the story is there. But um, removing things did not, um, I mean, doesn't really um, change the story in any way. But there's, yeah, the, but just out of necessity, there's certain things that you have to make a decision that don't go in. Um, and also certain details on history, because again, if, if you want to know more about a specific incident, you know, historical incident, a lot of it's in the footnotes, you know, um, but um, in the footnotes, I refer people on to other materials that they can look at. So, but that's a process of when you write a nonfiction historical narrative that the audience is also not academics, so. 40 pages of notes. <laughs> what? Of uh, 300-page books, so more than 10%. It's very thoroughly researched. So, so what was the long-term political impact of the event, and how did, or how might it have affected, through Miss Aldridge, the Rockefeller operations in China? I heard part of it. Just so you know, it's not you, it's me. It's uh, an echo here. Yes. So that affects me. So I'm going to have Nathan help me with the question. Okay. So what were the long-term impacts of the event? Politi political impacts. Good question. Um, right after the hostages were released, there was a coup. So the warlord, the, you know, not the warlord, but the president in power in Peking was basically forced out of office. And he was viewed as being very, it was not effective. And it was actually very, very sad for China because his, uh, the president, uh, his name is President Li, who was viewed, he was viewed as um, a reformer. Um, he was in the process of, of um, having a, a national constitution um, adopted, and that would have been very, very important for China's future. 
So um, the fact that President Lee was removed and the guy that came after him was really bad, it created some issues long term. Um, one, two, one of the bigger issues for China, a long-term impact, and why in the story I say it broke the Republic of China, and that is the issue of extraterritoriality. Now, historically, um, after, the opium, after the opium wars, the Western powers had negotiated agreements with the, the gov Qing government to allow their foreign, foreign nationals to be exempt from local laws to be exempt from the local um, courts and taxation and tariffs. And so these extraterritorial privileges were seen by China as a, a violation of sovereignty. You know, because the, the British, you know, and the, the French, the Germans, the Americans all had their own court systems. So if you violated the law, you could say, hey, I'm an American. I don't have to go to Chinese court. You have to, I have to be tried in US court. And so the Chinese didn't like that. Now, after the Qing government fell, the Republican government made it a top priority to have extraterritoriality um, basically um, revoked. Now, in 1923, that's when it was supposed to happen. And they actually had a commission set up for November of 1923 to talk to all the foreign governments and say, revoke extraterritoriality. All foreigners must be subject to Chinese law, Chinese courts, Chinese taxation. Now, Lin, this incident called the Lin Chung incident was um, in, um, resolved in, in June of 1923. What happened was the foreign government said, we're not revoking extraterritoriality because you can't run your government. We can't trust your government and you're, um, the government does, uh, doesn't know how to manage the country. So for the sake of protecting the foreigners, we're gonna keep extraterritoriality. Now, extraterritoriality existed another 20 years and was not until World War II when it was actually revoked. The problem with that is it actually weakened the Republican government and strengthened the Communist Party. It became a talking point for Mao they said the imperialists remain, they still have their extraterritoriality. Um, and Mao himself brought up the, what's called the Lin Chung incident, you know, in a speech two years after it happened. And he said, you know, this was just an example of the poor starving peasants fighting back against the warlords. So the long term in impact, in addition to the fact that President Lee was removed from office and brought in more of the same revolving door of incompetent warlords, but it also weakened, significantly weakened the Republican government, as well as it strengthened the party to move forward and really strengthen them. Now, Chiang Kai-shek came in and, and basically tried to reunite the country in 1927, but then a lot of other circumstances happened, like the invasion of Japan or, or by the Japanese and so forth. But the incident did trigger a number of issues that had a long-term impact. The other question was, did Lucy Aldrich's kidnapping affect Rockefeller operations? Oh, that, okay. Was that the question? That was, that was the second question. Okay. okay. <laughs> now, um, well, it, it didn't impact the, her, the, what they call Sukoni operations. Um, the key thing is, is that the bandits had no idea who she was, you know, and she didn't tell them. And the fact that they didn't know was probably uh, a good thing. Um, Rockefeller, if his, I mean, his, his sister-in-law was basically abandoned, all right, and, you know, after three and a half days or two and a half days, and then she was wandering around the countryside, but she was abandoned because she was kind of slowing everybody down. You know, as they ran, as they marched across the countryside, she was kind of difficult, you know? And the bandits were like, you know, for those that are um, slowing things down, either abandon them or shoot them, you know? And a lot of the Chinese captives were shot if they were slowing down. But for her, she was basically abandoned. Now. Then, since she got away, Sacconi basically, you know, and Rockefeller kind of backed off and didn't have to do anything, but there was no real impact. 
But um, Rockefeller himself, because he had significant investments in China, he also basically founded the first you know, modern medical school in Beijing. Um, I mean, he still was committed to, to the country, and to, to mod helping to modernize China. Um, but he was also making a ton of money selling kerosene and whatever else he was selling. But it didn't really have too much of an impact on him. The, the railroads, the, the express trains, there was an impact. They, it, it was really hard for them to um, rebuild the trust and to rebuild the tourism. I mean, really, they, they never really were able to rebound from that. And then, you know, in the 30s, the Japanese came in, and that whole area was devastated by the war. And it was President Lee. Well, do you remember the Lee's? Which pres which Lee that was? President. What the his president name? was uh, Li Yuanhong. Li Yuanhong. Li Yuanhong. Li Yuanhong. The, the president of China at the time was Li Yuanhong, right? Oh yeah, right, 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 right. Um, and yeah, and then yeah. Um. Hello, hello, James. My name is Sofia Linhares, and I would like to ask you. As a writer and as a lawyer, do you feel that is still today a political sensitive subject, this one? And if yes, how you as American writing about a political sensitive uh, subject, Chinese, are receiving all the feedbacks? Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, she asked, uh, so as an American and as a lawyer and a writer, is, did you come across any politically sensitive topics or is this a, could this be considered a politically sensitive topic, and I how mean, do you deal with that? The, um, the, at, at the, when I started writing and researching the book, the, oh, sorry, when I started writing and researching the book, um, I found that the archives was very, very um, open to allowing me to research. So I, I didn't have any trouble accessing materials. I mean, this is also the Republican area, so I think it's, for the most part, there was access was granted. It wasn't considered to be really a sensitive topic, also because the Chinese, the Chinese military, the, at the Institute of Military Sciences actually studied the whole incident to see, I mean, the views of the um, Chinese military was is that this was, this, this was an example of caving into foreign interest. You know, and um, but in terms of sensitive topics, um, you know, um, in the book I raise a, a number of concerns when you compare, you know, 20, oh, 1923 with 2023, and I do raise it in the book. I do mention, that, um, so you know, the book is not banned in China. I mean, um, a lot of history and politics are automatically banned. But I've been getting uh, the signals from the Chinese government is that they see this as a story that is worth telling. Um, there are sensitive issues I raise in the book, such as corruption. 1923, there was corruption. Same with today. They still need to address that. The other thing is the economic divide. And the other thing I raise is that in 1923, it was very, very easy to label someone that was taking up arms or protesting the warlord in power, but it's very easy to label them as bandits. And once you're labeled as a bandit, you can be, you know, shot, you know, and, and then that was a concern. There was very little due process. Now, fast forward 100 years, and you have situations in China where people try to either uh, raise their concerns or they participate in what they call the white paper protest, you know, and then they end up getting detained for national security issues. That's, in, that's, that's a concern, you know. So it's um, back in 1923, people were very easily labeled as troublemakers. Same thing happens today, in my view, in my view. You know, so it is a sensitive issue now. The book is going to be in a Chinese version, and it still needs to go through translation, and I'll have to see what they say about that. But that, those are issues I raise in the epilogue, um, you know, if, in making a comparison between um, 1923 and 2023. Um, I mean, it is a concern. But I can tell you the, the government has been so far supportive um, now, with the film, I don't want the film to become a patriotic film. I mean, Mao himself brought it up. I mean, in his own speech, he raised it, and he didn't compliment 
the bandits. But what he did do is use it as an example to promote the party. He basically said the reason they failed, the reason the bandits and the peasants failed, was they didn't have the organizational skills of the party. So it was more of a pitch. Um, and there was a lot of discussions in Chinese academic circles as to whether that was complimenting Sun Miao. Now, when the 100th anniversary, which was last May, um, in Shandong and Zhaotuang, where all this happened, we had a big banquet. The government put on a banquet. You know, and if you've ever been to Chinese banquets, you get this table with like 20 people around, and next to me was Sun Miao's um, grand nephew. You know, he, he and I were like the, the guest of honor or whatever, and so I started asking him questions. Um, you know, um, the same questions I asked before was, um, you know, what did, what did you, um, you know, what you heard in the family about your uncle and so forth. But I also asked a question publicly. I said, do you consider your uncle to be a hero? And I, now the moment, the moment that question was asked, the three government officials around the table were like, you know, <laughs> you know, because actually, in order to be considered a hero under China, in, in mainland China, it's a whole different process. And so the way the government officially views Sun Miao is I feel that they, they don't see him as a hero because people were killed. I mean, there were people that were killed in this incident. Um, but they look at him as more of a person that you know, had, um, I mean, he was a little misguided, but he, he had everything in his heart right, his, was, were, was right. You know, so, I mean, uh, they, um, so, the, but I can tell you, and um, the government is generally supportive, and part of that is that they do want this to be made into to a film and also to drive tourism, because this is a great, I mean, this mountain is a wonderful place to go. It's incredible. You know, and a lot of the architecture that was in existence in 1923 exists. So they are very supportive, at least at this time. You know, we'll have to see as we move forward, but I don't, I mean, um, yeah, there's sensitivities you have to be concerned about, and the book even has some sensitive issues raised about like being troublemakers and lack of due process and so forth. But so far that has not led to the banning of the book and all. Now, I would welcome, um, um, I mean, you'd visit the website, you know, and, and actually you can communicate and send me notes, and um, if you have any comments, um, you can communicate through the website. The website is The Peking Express. Um, you have to put the in. If you don't put the in, you'll get a restaurant in Chicago or something. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, I mean, take a look at that. It also may spark your interest on, you know, just uh, the photographs and some side things. And, but, um, but yeah, I'm happy to, yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions or comments on that, it's uh, happy to communicate with you on the story. Um, but anyway. Uh, James, I I'm curious, um, during your investigation, how easy or how difficult was it to reach and to speak with the descendants of the bandits. Yeah. Uh, how did you find the descendants of the, oh. uh, and uh, how easy was it to... Here, here I mean, in Macau, good... we, had, uh, we made some reporting about uh, an incident in 1910 of a fight between local yeah. uh, troops and uh, Chinese pirates. And the descendants, first of all, resist to talk about the, the incident at all. And then they said, okay, I'm going to speak, but you are not going to like what I have to say. So the, the, the attitude was really uh, confrontational. Yeah. About the descendants, yeah. I, yeah. Mean, I, I was able to, um, um, actually the internet, the internet is a beautiful tool for tracking people. And if you're able to, um, the more unique the name is, the easier it is. You know, there was, I was trying to track down a guy by the name of William Smith. <laughs> You know, I mean, it was almost next to impossible because, you know, it's a very common name. But um, through the internet, I was able to track down a lot of the families. Um, and I didn't get all of them. And, and so I was able to track down a lot of them that had a lot of resources. Now, for the bandits, um, those I relied upon going through the local university, Zhaotuang University, and also the local, the local government um, 
the Tourism Bureau, as well as they have a Cultural Relics and History Bureau, went through them to help me track down, you know, those that were descendants of the bandits. Um, the, um, but there's, I mean, some people, they just could not either, you know, their families died off and there was no descendants or, um, you know, or the records just, you know, you could never find. Some of them I just got lost to history. I was able to, to locate several de descendants that didn't um, even keep records, but they had a few photographs, but others, others had a boxes and boxes of stuff, you know, but it was a process. It took a lot of time. Um, and I could have stopped at all the records that I got just in archives, but I'm glad I chased the descendants because that really made a difference in the story. So, is there, did I answer the question? Did I? Yeah, and um, maybe, uh, how, what, what was the attitude that? Oh, the attitude of the, I mean, I mean um, a lot of these people are either late 70s or in their 80s, and some at first, I mean, it, they were kind of resistant. I actually had to track down the their, their, the um, the younger generation, and then they put me in touch with their grandfathers, who because he's not on the internet or whatever. But several of them question, you know, why after a hundred years is somebody chasing these this family story? So, um, and there was a few of them that were very very surprised, um, but. Part of the reason I knew I had a story to write is once I met them, I told them I'm going to come and meet you, and I'm going to you're going to we're going to meet in person. So I did a, a lot of travel, but several of the families I actually met in person, and I'm glad I did because then they started really warming up to this and realizing this was for real. Because uh, you know, also too, people get concerned about maybe fraud or whatever, so they don't want to be, you know, you can try to explain all day by email or phone, but until they meet you, it makes a different, um, a different story. But I didn't get everybody. In fact, after the book came out, several came to me after the fact. It doesn't change the story, you know, it just get, actually gets more photos. But, um, but overall, it was a good experience. The reactions were good. Um, and people were very generous with their time. Um, and in, interesting, the fun thing is in some of the book talks, you know, I invited the families to attend. And they were, they were like rock stars, you know, because they'd be able to talk separately from me, but you have a descendant here talking about the stories that my grandfather told. You know, when I was a kid, I would talk about the bandits in his time with the bandits. So it was pretty amazing to have them as part of the book talks. Um, and so I did that in probably four or five cities in the US. I brought in, you know, um, some of the descendants. Uh, one of the things I want to do, and I haven't done it yet, was to do like a Zoom call. And of all of the descendants, including the, you know, the bandits, you know, the descendants of the bandits. Um, and do like a Zoom call and get everybody together, but it's it's kind of hard to do because some of these people don't use, you know, don't use Zoom, you know. But but anyway, overall the reaction has been very, you know, very very positive. I'm interested in the role of the correspondents, the media, so to speak, and the relative immediacy, immediacy of information about the hostages. So um, you mentioned that there was a letter system as the, as the hostage situation dragged out. Were the correspondents with the hostages? And if they were, did the bandits use them to present their side of the story as well? So the question is about the media and the role of the media. Um, how did the media get information? Did they communicate with the bandits? And uh, so how did the story unfold? Uh, the, that's a very, very good question. Um, what had happened was there a rescue operation um, was created, and part of the because after the first week, they everyone realized this was going to drag on be, um, for a long time, and so they started. They had to feed all these people, and so um, they started a rescue operation, and part of the rescue operation also had a mail service. You know, and so, and you know, the, the hostages would say, I want books, I want magazines, and they were sending letters back and forth. And so the correspondents actually were communicating with some of the hostages and the bandits, 
you know, they were writing back and forth. So there was, between the bandit camp and where this rescue operation took place, um, let me see if I can find it. Um, you know, um, all right, so you can see in the far right corner it says American Rescue Mission. That was actually the American business community in Shanghai and Peking got together to create, like, to bring food in. In fact, the guy that wrote this, this story and said it all adds zest to the journey, he's the guy in the photo, he's the one that managed the rescue operation. But to answer your question, the, the text or the substance that went into the stories of all these journalists was actually from, you know, from the bandit camps, from the hostages. They were sending letters every single day. You know? And if you look at the top middle, the top middle photo, it, it's what, what they called the Cooley Express. It's not politically correct, but that's a bag of mail. You know? And so the mail was going up and forth. And it was a, it was a phenomenal operation because over time, you know, the hostages are saying, you know, you know, please send, you know, you know, fresh water, fresh clothes, books, magazines. And it became a huge operation moving things up and down the mountain. I mean, it was these guys, you know, the, these workers were walking a total of then it was 12 miles. It was 12 miles and then 24 miles round trip. There's no there's no road to the bandit camp. It's like a path. You know, so they were bringing mail up um, every day. And so that's how the correspondents got all the news. Um, but the Chinese government at the time was like, we don't want any more bad stories. And so they were trying to stop all that. But, but um, for the most part, a lot of the um, substance um, of the articles came directly from, you know, came directly from the bandit camps, from the hostages themselves that were writing letters. I'd just like to follow that up then to ask, in no sense then the bandits were getting their side out through this correspondence. It was, it was the rescue operation and the hostages that were able to communicate? Okay, yeah, so were the bandits able to sort of tell their side of the story through this correspondence or not really? They, they definitely did. They told their side of the story by and through the hostages as well as in communicating with the negotiators. You know, and the negotiators were actually, you know, going up to the bandit camp and talking with them. Um, so the bandits did, and they, the bandits actually released a number of proclamations as to what they wanted and all. And it wasn't ransom. It was not. It wasn't an economic issue. What they, they really wanted the warlords out. You know, of the region, they wanted to be reinstated to the army. They wanted their back pay. Uh, you know, but they were definitely there was a lot of communications with the bandits um, as well. So, and the the reporters were on the scene. You know, the reporters were there at this location, which is actually um, where the res rescue operation took place. Was actually a mining company, which still exists today. And the building, the building is still there exactly where all this took place is still in existence. Um, and I believe there's photos on the website where you can actually see the building. Um, but that it's, it's a mining compound where all of, you know, all of the rescuers and fixers showed up and, and the correspondents were there as well. The mining company had a, the only telegraph station in the whole region. So they was able to send things out by telegraph right, you know, from um, on site. All right, well, I'm told that uh, we have to wrap up, but uh, please everyone join me in thanking once again James Schumer for a very uh,